Arabica and Robusta prices are both trading at 10-year highs on the commodity market. So this should be a great thing for farmers, right? We can rest easy that our appetite for two, five, ten cups of coffee is finally paying off? Or is it? Let's dive in. But wait, 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 just a second. First, some real talk. These videos take us a ton of time and effort. And so really all we ask from you is to hit that subscribe button. It's not that difficult and it helps us with the YouTube algorithm. And if you'd really like to show us your love, we have a Patreon page that you can check out in the link below. For this video, I wanted to provide a slightly different perspective based on my own experience on the flow of money and who controls it. Through my time in finance, I've had the privy of both trading billions of dollars and getting first-hand access to how decisions of where to invest billions of dollars are made. To an outsider, sometimes it can just seem like all a farmer needs to do is carefully grow the crop and process it and pray that the weather gods are on their side. But let me ask you a question. If you were watching the news and you saw that there was political unrest in Turkey, would you ever think that that could impact a farmer in India or Ethiopia? And that too in coffee. Yup. That's right, I'm not talking crazy, and stick with me. But before we learn how to connect some wildly disparate dots like this, let's lay some foundation first. Primary products such as gold, oil, and agricultural products are traded in financial markets as commodities. The C market represents the world benchmark for Arabica coffee traded through the ICE exchange. Similarly, Robusta has its own coffee market. Coffee, like a lot of other commodities, is largely traded via a futures market. What this means is that rarely does physical coffee actually exchange hands when traded through an exchange. It's often a hypothetical bet on where you think the price of coffee will be at a future point in time. Or if importers have delivery obligations at a future point in time, they can use the futures market as a hedge. For the purpose of this video, we will largely look at Arabica, though we will touch upon what's happening in the Robusta markets this year too. Contracts on the C market are for specific dates, March, May, July, September, and December for each year. So given we're in November 2021, the date that's closest to us would be December 2021, making that the active futures market. The C market represents the price of coffee in cents per pound for the physical delivery of green beans that qualify according to specified standards by the exchange. The size of each contract is 37,500 pounds. It has to be from one of 20 countries of origin and delivered to a licensed warehouse in specific ports in the US and Europe. As of November 26, the sea market trades at 245, which means it's 245 cents per pound for coffee or $2.45 per pound of coffee. So if I buy one contract on the sea market, I agree to pay $2.45 per pound of coffee on the 20th of December, which is when the contract settles, no matter what the price of coffee is actually on that day. For all intents and purposes, there is no real differentiation between the different types of Arabica, the regions, the varietals, how carefully they're grown and processed. This essentially just bulks all Arabica into one. There is a quoted price for Brazilian coffee through a different exchange, and there is also some distinction between different origins of Arabica, with Mexico, Salvador, and Guatemala getting the sea market price for coffee, Colombia getting a premium, and Burundi, Rwanda, India, and Brazil trading at a discount to the sea market price. But the sea market forms the foundation for all Arabica coffee as a reference or a starting point. According to a 2019 paper on the economic viability and sustainability of coffee production by J.D. Sachs, director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University, total global coffee revenues are estimated at approximately $250 billion. Statista shows that the U.S. revenues are estimated at around $82 billion. So straight off the bat, that's a whopping 32% to a non-producing country. If you remove Brazil, the top four countries in terms of revenue are US, Japan, Canada, and Germany, and they form close to 70% of total global revenues. And unsurprisingly, they're all in the global north. This split in revenue between the global north and the global south highlights a really important point about where the dollar premium comes from in the value chain. Typically, it's concentrated downstream at the roaster retailer level because that's where intangible value is often created through things like branding and storytelling. 
I'd like to share how market forces beyond one's comprehension can actually affect decision making. So let's take a look at how the free market, through its promises of efficiency and optimizing supply and demand forces, can actually take agency away from the very farmers without whom this drink would be a non-starter. I'd like to run through what's happened in the almost post-COVID world of 2021 in coffee markets. But before we do that, let's play a game of connect the dots. Sweet, so now that we have some foundation out of the way, let's look at the mind-boggling connection of how political unrest in Turkey can affect an Ethiopian or an Indian coffee farmer. This is a hypothetical example, and I know you're probably thinking I'm low-key crazy, but stick with me, because I'd like to show how interconnected markets really can be. Turkey isn't even a producing country of coffee, so how could something like this even happen? Institutions like banks, hedge funds, pension funds that trade the markets in reasonably large sizes typically classify countries like Turkey, Brazil, India, Russia, etc. under the umbrella of emerging markets. Now, say you have political instability or inflation in a country like Turkey, that could lead to a weakening of its currency, the Turkish lira. This weakening is usually expressed versus the US dollar. Now, these institutions that have investments in different emerging markets, in light of this Turkey problem, may want to reduce their investments across more of their emerging market portfolio in case of a contagion or a proxy effect. This could therefore lead to a weakening across the board of the Indian rupee, the Brazilian riai, the Russian ruble, etc. You get my drift. Now, if the Brazilian riai weakens enough, a coffee farmer could benefit. How, you may ask? If the Brazilian riai weakens, it means that the amount of riai you get for $1 goes up. So in 2020 January, the dollar Brazil exchange rate was at four, which means that for each dollar, you get four Brazilian riai. In the span of five months, this went to 5.85 or 46% weaker. So when a Brazilian coffee farmer sees the riai weaken a lot, they will likely increase the supply of coffee because it means selling their coffee abroad and converting it into more riai locally. This increase in supply that wasn't expected by the markets could mean that coffee prices actually come lower because Brazil is the largest exporter of coffee. This spillover effect would then impact a coffee farmer in Ethiopia or India who's likely completely unaware of what triggered this move in the first place. Pretty wild, right? When you have a futures market, like in the case of coffee, speculation about where coffee prices will go can disproportionately impact prices in the market, even if it's just for the short term. To add to that, you have vested interests from large players, such as importers, which means that prices can be artificially distorted and not strictly dictated by consumer demand on one side and farmer supply on the other. Big importers actually benefit from depressed coffee prices because this means they can buy coffee cheaply from farmers and sell them at a much higher price further down the supply chain, where value tends to be concentrated. What this means is that large commercial companies like importers actually have net short positions, which is that they are net sellers of coffee in the future. This creates an imbalance between their buying obligations and the number of contracts of coffee that they've sold. This actually keeps prices lower than where they would be if those shorts did not exist. And they're able to do this because of access to vast amounts of capital. Whilst the nitty gritty of these trades are likely beyond the scope of just one YouTube video, what's important to know is that growing demand for coffee doesn't always mean that one, prices go up, and two, even more importantly, that these prices actually go to the farmer, the very people that we so dearly depend on for our daily drinking habit. But hang on a second. We did say at the beginning of this video that Arabica and Robusta are trading at 10-year highs on the commodity markets. And if you'd read this headline a day ago, you'd think this was great news for the farmer, right? But like we've just talked about, there's so much more than meets the eye. Both Arabica and Robusta have been trading at their 10-year highs. So why has that happened in 2021 and what happens next? Let's start with Arabica. Arabica coffee is currently trading at 245 cents as of November 26, 2021. This is $2.45, which is a 97% increase from the $1.24 it was trading exactly a year ago. So what exactly has happened? Has demand surged post-COVID? Have people started paying farmers more? Well, not quite. 
The biggest exporter of Arabica coffee is Brazil. And so what happens to Brazilian coffee sets the tone for the broader market. It has implications for supply chains globally and matters for anyone who has anything to do with coffee. Brazil this year has been hit by a triple whammy, a couple of intense hits of frost, followed by some severe drought that's been plaguing much of Latin America. This has been followed by unusually high rains in October. So frost in July means a lot of plants end up dying because of frostburn, and younger trees are more vulnerable because of thinner barks. This, coupled with severe drought, means reduced moisture, which reduces expected yields further, and the frost affects the plants directly, rather than freezing water droplets on them. And since then, we've been hit with a short but intense period of rains in October, which could seem like a welcome relief, but it's actually meant increased fungal infection on the plants. Now think about what that means for a place like Brazil, where almost all of the coffee is a product of mechanized farming. You may have to dig out all of the crop, even the ones that aren't destroyed, because machines can't really distinguish between good crop and bad crop when the lands are destroyed. Now, as a farmer, this means taking at least a three-year hit because new plants take at least three to four years to bear fruit. The markets also very closely track weather patterns, and the La Nina pattern is currently affecting much of Latin America, which is a cold spell and results in extended periods of drought. The USDA actually projects that Brazilian exports will be down 27% year-on-year in 2021-2022, the drought in Latin America means that Brazil isn't its only victim. Colombian farmers have faced severe issues too. Ironically, rising coffee prices have actually hurt farmers in Brazil and Colombia. Farmers would have entered into contracts in 2020 to sell 2021's harvest, and prices last year were lower than this year, so they haven't been able to capitalize on this year's move higher at all. Coffee farmers have also been hit with rising input costs, what this means, for example, is that fertilizer prices are at 10-year highs. So farmers in Brazil and Colombia have actually started to default on their contracts because of mounting losses and reduced yields. The cascade effect from this means that import and export companies that have delivery obligations to buyers haven't actually gotten the beans from farmers, so they have to fulfill those obligations from older stockpiles at the exchange. Not really your freshest specialty coffee, is it? Next, let's take a look at what's happening in Robusta markets. The Robusta coffee market has its own dynamics at play. Vietnam, which is the world's second largest producer, is responsible for 17% of the world's coffee share. But more importantly, it is the largest producer of Robusta. Though halfway across the world from Brazil and in entirely different climate conditions, Robusta is also trading at 10-year highs, but for different reasons entirely. Here's why. As we all know, COVID began in Asia and then spread to the rest of the world. Lockdowns and supply chains were affected in a similar order. Now, during the pandemic, people were unwilling to let empty shipping containers out at sea. So a lot of ships have been stuck inland and at ports. As things started to open up first in Asia, loaded shipping containers were quick to leave Asia, but then ended up getting stuck at the other end of the world due to lockdowns, labor shortages, and weather changes, which led to an enormous increase in freight prices. A huge backlog and logjam of shipping containers has created a massive global supply shortage, and this has particularly affected Asia. This has had a dramatic ripple effect across industries, including coffee. As the Vietnamese struggle to find shipping containers to load their coffee, this has pushed robusta prices to 10-year highs too. This is just another example of how interconnected our world really is. It's unlikely that we think of big shipping containers and people working in the docks when we're busy brewing our morning pour over. We're used to going down the road in a pair of flip-flops to the local artisan store and picking up a bag of coffee, or at worst, ordering a bag online and expecting it to show up two to three days later. In reality, the gargantuan task of getting those beans to your cup is what shapes coffee prices every single day. So now that we've had a big dose of hopelessness with our morning cuppa, is there anything we can actually do about all of this? Realizing that the world is this interconnected actually opens our eyes to the truth that anything that we consume is part of a very complex system. And systemic change is actually a lot harder because it requires coordinated effort from multiple actors across the supply chain. The task at hand feels so monumental, we can feel tempted to just hang up our boots and give up. But it's not all gloom and doom. There are things we can do. First, education. This is twofold. Both as consumers and more importantly as coffee professionals, being aware of what we sell, what we buy, and how those impact 
people that we rarely think of, is the best start that we can make. Sometimes, simply buying more of a good thing doesn't really fix the issue. Next up is farmer education. Coffee isn't unique in that almost all of the value is concentrated at the bottom end of the supply chain, where branding, storytelling, and other intangible attributes exponentially increases the price premium that can be charged. As farmers become more connected to the entire process, seed to cup, they can begin to participate in higher value parts of the business too. We're starting to see some signs of it with farms and estates directly branding and selling their own coffee, staying very close to the storytelling aspect of it throughout. If we can support more farms like this, especially the smallholders and smaller cooperatives, we will all come out better for it. Second, direct trade. This leans on part of the previous point. With so many farmers being smallholder farmers, direct trade really does help. These farmers don't have a lot of access to capital, and so direct trade relationships with long-term partners who invest in their farm infrastructure can be mutually beneficial. Farmers benefit by upgrading their farms so that they're able to grow, sort, and process their beans better and improve consistency, and buyers and roasters benefit from the fruits of their labor in the form of higher coffee quality with fewer defects further down the line. Farmers may not be able to sell all of their coffee through direct trade, but it helps them in getting more than they would on the sea market. A small example would be companies like Counterculture that publish exactly how much they pay for a pound of coffee through their sustainability reports. Third, provenance. Knowing exactly where things come from makes it a lot easier to distinguish between types, varietals, regions, etc. It also improves the communication between buyers and sellers. It also leaves less room for squeezing the farmers and extracting value from them at prices that are loss-making. Provenance, along with education, can help develop agroecological practices such as intercropping. Coffee has long been grown and processed alongside other crop, and expanding these practices more broadly can help make the industry more sustainable. Environmentally, yes, but also socially and economically. In years that coffee becomes loss-making for farmers, they have other crops that they can fall back on. This is especially important in the era of climate change, where extreme weather events are not really the outliers anymore, they're the norm. As a former emerging markets trader, I got to experience these market dynamics very closely. In today's world of capitalism, which was a system that was created on the heels of colonialism, power is very much still concentrated in Western financial centers. Working out of London and New York, it's easy to feel removed from the day-to-day -day of farmers on the ground when you're sitting in front of five screens in a building amidst skyscrapers. These centers are deeply disconnected from the real people across the globe whose livelihoods are determined by forces they're largely completely unaware of. So the ultimate goal when we think about questions like how do we decolonize coffee should be how do we think about changing the system? I hope that this provided food or rather drink for thought. When I was a sophomore at Stanford University, Steve Jobs did a commencement speech for the then graduating class where he said, you can't connect the dots looking forward, you can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. Coffee is deeply personal for me for this very reason. It's been a way for me to connect the disparate dots in my own life, both professional and personal. So now it's time to hear from you. Did you find this video useful? What are ways that you think we can change the system, or at the very least adapt it, so that the people who are responsible for growing our favorite bean benefit from it too? Also, would you like to see more of this content? Please share your thoughts in the comments below and we'll be sure to check them out. Thank you so much for sticking with me till the end, and until next time, brew aramse. But worry not, young Padawan. Sometimes simply buying more of a good thing doesn't really fix the issue. I can't have to... <laughs>